It's a great pleasure to be here, and I want to commend the, the Jindal Global Law School for uh, its uh, developing this link with the problems of rural governance. I think this is a, very important, and I see your your program is one that, that uh, aims at, at developing knowledge of the grassroots reality. And uh, it's the legal system, too, has a grassroots reality that uh, is different, perhaps, than the way uh, it, it appears. Uh, I see one of the concerns in the program is legal literacy, uh, and I want to urge that we should be concerned not only with their literacy, the literacy of rural people, but with our own literacy in the sense of our ability uh, as lawyers and as uh, activists to read Social, the social reality of the law that we propose to use. Uh, now about a hundred, exactly really a hundred years ago that uh, uh, an American uh, professor named Roscoe Pound, who Dr. Menon mentioned, uh, formulated, he said there's a, there's a gap between the law and the books on the one hand and the law in action as it really, uh, as it really works at the, at the uh, level of society. And, and uh, this gap uh, is something that it's, we must understand if we have to, to uh, use law in a productive uh, way. Uh, so when we talk about the gap, that, that collapses all kinds of, of different things, a great variety of things into a single mass. And what I would like to use my time here to try to separate out some of the elements in that mass and uh, look at them separately, maybe just give them names so that we can keep keep track of them. I think one of them is what you might call one part of this gap that we must address is what we might call dualism. Uh, by this I mean when you have different practices, you might have one, the same law, but different practices apply to different groups and strata within the population. It, it's like a perverse personal law. Uh, a well-known example for exa would be the kind of elaborate uh, protocol of criminal procedure in arrests of rich people compared with a very rough treatment that's accorded to the poor. Uh, uh, that would be one example of this kind of dualism. Then some, somewhat related to this is what we might call tokenism. That is the taking some major commitment in the law and implementing it on a symbolic or token scale rather than extending it to everyone who's, who's supposedly covered. Uh, take, for example, prosecutions under the Protection of Civil Rights Act. Uh, so again, there's a gap between what the law says and what actually happens on the ground. Uh, another variant of that is what we might call selective enforcement. Uh, that the law gets, uh, a, you have a general law, but it gets applied to certain situations within its scope but not to others. Uh, think, for example, of encroachments on public property. Some of them, uh, some of them, there's enforcement to to eliminate them. In many others, there's not. Uh, so the law 
uh, gets uh, enforced sometime, but not others, and there's, a, uh, there's obviously a pattern here. And then sometime you have laws that are not enforced at all. Uh, just simple non-enforcement. Uh, a, a recent example would be, for example, uh, of the law being a dead letter, as we say, it would be the 1993 legislation outlawing dry latrines. Uh, and then finally, we should say there's what they call perverse enforcement of the law, where the law is used to accomplish something that's quite apart, quite different uh, than the purpose for which the law was, was enacted. Uh, and a particular legal provision can, can shift from one of these to another, from a dead letter to, to token enforcement, to dualism, and so on. Uh, now, all of those, of course, assume that there is some definite rule there that could be enforced or some accepted standard to be applied. But in many cases, uh, if we look at the, 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 the law on the books, we find that the rule or standard is itself unclear or incomplete, a subject to multiple and conflicting understandings. Uh, th th this is what we generally call indeterminacy. Uh, it seems to be a definite law, but it's really quite, uh, quite indeterminate exactly uh, what it is. Uh, and one final sort of, of uh, variance between the law and the books and the law and action that I want to mention, because it seems to me it's, it's a very important one, is what might call uh, mistaken or misfired instrumentalism. By instrumentalism, we, in law, we generally mean that uh, a legislature or a court undertakes to pursue some clearly stated goal uh, and says, in order to accomplish this, we're going to have this rule which will lead us to that goal. Uh, but it often happens that the means that are supposed to lead to the goal uh, don't do it. They may lead somewhere else instead, and they may have unintended consequences. Uh, here, I'll give you one Indian example of, of uh, this. Think um, about uh, 20 years ago, the Supreme Court of India undertook, at the urging of, of uh, pro bono advocates, to remedy the condition of the bonded laborers in the quarries, uh, actually not far from here, I think. Uh, and uh, the court issued a stirring decree ordering the cessation of these practices. Uh, Twenty years later, uh, investigators went back and looked and found that conditions had actually not changed very much. Uh, why not? Well, the court had not understood the entrenched nature of these practices built on the laborers' lack of social capital and their dependence on the quarry owners who had no incentive to change these conditions. Uh, so uh, it's one thing to say we're doing X in order to produce Y, but it doesn't, uh, the, the, the causal chain there may be defective and X may not in fact lead to Y. And I should say, this, this kind of variance is not confined to systems with thin resources. Uh, a, a, a quite spectacular American example of this uh, inadvertent and perverse consequences would be the war, our so-called war on drugs, uh, which is an immensely expensive undertaking that squanders vast resources and consigns hundreds of thousands of people to, to prison and 
diminished life chances and so on. So uh, it, it's good to have uh, courts and legislatures that, that have uh, interest in, in producing uh, important improvements and pursuing their goals in a systematic way, but that has to be based on, on some, some uh, reliable knowledge about the relationship between the means and the end. Now, I don't mean to, to portray all of these departures uh, as pathological or deviant or blameworthy. These are really the familiar and perhaps ineradicable Roots, uh, uh, sorry, ineradicable traits of legal systems. This is the way these systems behave in a real world setting with friction and gravity rather than in, a, in an ideal world of untrammeled motion. So this kind of variance is not pathology, uh, but it, it is something we must learn about uh, so we can can learn how to, to contain these problems, uh, how to combine them with our, our knowledge of the law uh, and uh, affect uh, and, and pursue uh, our goals with strategic intelligence. So thank you very, very much.